Hey everybody, welcome to another thrilling episode of Data Exposure. I'm your host Scott Klein and with me today is Maxim. Maxim, welcome back to the show. Yeah, uh, nice to be back. Yep, so it's always, uh, always fun having you back because we love talking about the kind of the uh, big data topics that you always come prepared to talk about. Uh, but before we get started, I want you to take a second. For those that don't know who Maxim is, shame on you, first of all. <laughs> uh, but take a second and introduce yourself. Uh, sure, uh, I'm Maxim Lukyanov, Program Manager on Big Data Team at Microsoft, working on Azure HD Insight Service, yep. primarily on Spark, uh, our servers, yep. those kind of things. Cool. Yeah, yeah so um, you and I have been talking about, like, there's this whole mo you know, push around you know, Spark, right? And, and oh, yeah. supporting Spark and HD Insight and things like that, right? And we're, uh, I think there's, um, you know, the reason you're here is, to, you know, how do we think about you know, let's do a, let's do a, because you and I were talking about, let's do a series on Spark and how we can get Spark, you know, people interested in Spark and HD Insight, right? And get the performance out of that, right? Oh, yeah. It's a very good time to talk about performance in Spark. Like yep. Spark 2 was out for about uh, six months. Mm -hmm. So we have enough time to kind of assess how it works. Yeah. We have many customers doing various interesting things with Spark 2, like bringing it to a kind of porting their old workloads yeah. to Spark 2 or any new ones. And uh, we accumulated some experience and in many cases uh, Spark 2 kind of gives a very good performance boost for customers workload yeah. and after optimizations that we do with customers okay. they see like 10x improvement in performance so it's kind of a kind very cool. very good stuff yep yeah. so we talked about doing a, a quick series you know a quick series on spark so let's get started so why don't you take it from there you know how do we think about spark where's spark today how do we think about spark 2.0 you know 2.x right and what does that give mm -hmm. us right yeah, so uh, today, just uh, to be clear, like performance is a very deep topic. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's, right. so, that, so that's why we decided to do a kind of a series yeah, sure. of topics, and yeah. we'll see how many <laughs> chunks we'll need to have. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, performance we're, is a we're deep We're at least topic. having one, right? <laughs> May have a second one. <laughs> yeah, at least we give it justice <laughs> yeah. by having multiple, <laughs> multiple, <laughs> topics. <laughs> multiple topics. Yeah, So yeah. that's good. So we yep. did at least one thing right. Uh, and uh, in general, Spark today kind of stands in a very nice position. Like when we have these experiences with customers yep. trying out new engines that comes with, uh, came out with Spark 2.x, we uh, gen in general uh, hear the sen sentiment that hey, Spark 2 uh, new engine is kind of awesome. Yeah. Uh, but uh, how do I? What do I need to do now with this new engine to like get the max out of it? How right. how can use it in a most efficient way? Okay, cool. Because it's a new thing, and yeah. like we all kind of learning how to use it. Yep, okay, cool. Yeah, so uh, to get started, so what can we start with? Well, uh, let's start with uh, kind of a basics. So Spark use cases as they apply to performance. Okay. So Spark is, has this nice property where it's kind of a platform and applies to a variety of workloads in a very consistent and unified way. That's why people like it. Yeah, okay. So you can use it for batch, for real-time event processing, for machine learning, and you can build also custom applications. There is a plethora of ISV applications that use Spark as their compute engine, okay. and oh, you can okay. use it for data warehousing, just to list them all. So, right. And the nice property is that you will use the kind of this single execution engine, consistent APIs across all of these workloads. Okay. Very nice. But this is where we kind of see Spark being used today, right? Yeah, yeah. so this is today, and uh, basically in, in this talk we'll focus on how you optimize these use cases okay. from the point of view of performance. Okay. Uh, and these colors uh, kind of illustrate like traditionally uh, we use kind of engineering kind of brain power to go and like, hey, I know this set of techniques to optimize performance, so I'll go apply them. And this is blue, blue traditional yeah. kind of use cases belong to this use case. So you can use engineers to optimize performance. Yeah, because when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, okay, you know, we have ETL batch processing. There's, you know, if I'm a SQL guy, you know, yeah. I know yeah. we have some ETL being like SSIS and things like that. Or we look at Azure, there's more of kind of a, you know, Azure Data Lake type of scenario where we yeah. didn't get into your streaming real-time event processing. Now we have Azure Stream Analytics. So how do, it's interesting to see, you know, how does Spark, um, Come and complement or work with in, in in these areas, right? Because yeah. you know they're at this point we're uh, I don't want to say competing, but at the same time, it's like you know how do we think about where does Spark fit in when we have these other technologies? Oh yeah, that, that's a very good question. So uh, th that that's where Spark kind of comes in and unifies them all. Like okay. hey, you can do all of that with Spark. Oh okay. A and the, the way it's done is like hey, Spark was born like a, as a batch processing engine, so you can certainly do SQL and batch processing yeah. pipelines. But it also has Spark streaming, where you can say, hey, here's my real-time stream of events, so let me like process them uh, in a real-time fashion. And Spark says, hey, this 
generic compute engine that I have. Like uh -huh. you can use it for both. You can oh, okay. um, um, process batch, you can process streaming. And the nice property of that kind of uh, central compute engine is that this performance optimization techniques that you use for it apply now to both streaming and uh, okay. batch in many cases. Like, of course, there are okay. some specific use cases, but in general, this set of optimization techniques that we are going through, going to go through, yeah. is applicable to all of these workloads with a different degree of applicability. Okay. So that's, that's kind of the nice. Ah, uh, that makes sense. Okay. Th yeah. That's primary point of why <laughs> Spark is so beloved by developer community is that it, it's this catch-all. Yeah, it's a kind of a catch-all. You learn this uh, engine once, and then you apply your knowledge to all of these workloads. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, very efficient. Yeah, very nice. Uh, yeah, right. so uh, let's move uh, forward to say, hey, so why does it matter? Why performance matter? So uh, as we already established in this talk, Spark 2. Point, we like Spark 2.x. It's like this new engine that we are going to talk about in Langs is, is great. Uh, but uh, in terms of optimizing performance of this engine, how mm. much of a difference does it make when you optimize performance? So let's do a little query, uh, little query here. So I have this uh, cluster, actually, uh, let, let's take a look at the cluster. So it's a edges inside cluster, Spark cluster, 40 nodes of D14 VMs, kind of a okay. sizable cluster. Oh, nice. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it has our test data set of 100 terabytes. Wow. Okay. And, and we'll go like run different <laughs> queries and different pieces of queries. And this uh, data set is our test data set. We build it based on the problems that we saw in production with our okay. uh, customers. So we kind of reproduce some of the problems that we have seen in our test data set, so we can l later on go back and take a look at them. Okay. So uh, one of the smaller queries that runs just on a 10 terabyte table, so it kind of finishes fast enough for us for the talk. So if you just uh, run this query, uh, and um, you'll see kind of a standard Spark shell, so we are using bare bones kind of Spark tools here, yeah. so to kind of reduce number of translations. Ah. So uh, in Spark shell, if you run this query, uh, that's an optimized query. Uh, you can see that it runs fairly quickly for the 10 terabyte table, and it finishes off in some number of seconds. So let's take a look at how quickly it finished. So it should be here. Let's refresh. So we just rerun this query. So it took 19 seconds. Mm -hmm. so okay. It's yep. Fairly fast. Uh, almost in the interactive, very interactive kind of uh, landscape. Yeah. Okay. And now, if you look at the query graph of that query, you can see that it was fairly sophisticated query. So it has wow. all of these kind of joints, <laughs> yeah. aggregations, different tables. Yeah. There, there is this one big fact table. Uh, that's a kind of a primary thing that this query is querying. Mm -hmm. And then you join multiple uh, other tables to it. And then you do some more aggregations, some more joins, some more aggregations. <laughs> so that's kind of, yeah, pretty it, complex. It, yeah, pretty complex. But the thing is, it's Pretty typical query as well. It kind of represents the star schema. You can see that yeah, yeah. this is a fact table, and then all of kind of dimensions that you join in into yeah. this, this guy. And uh, from here, even at this uh, high level of view, you can see some patterns in this query. You can see that this nice long blue rectangles mm -hmm. here. So in our performance talk, we'll discuss hey, why it's good to have this nice long blue rectangles. Yeah. So you'll we'll get to understand why it's good. We'll get to understand okay. how, how you go about making sure that the query plan of your uh, query looks, uh, looks well. You can find uh, the differences. Okay. But just to make a point, so what if we didn't do the optimization that yeah. we are going to go through? So what would be the impact? So I will spare you running the long query because it's <laughs> <laughs> okay. kind of long to wait. But I have pre-recorded results of that query. So even if you just remove some, some parts of the optimizations from the query, you can see that the result would be like a, a 1.5 minutes okay. or 1.7 minutes right. compared to the like roughly 20 seconds. Seconds. Okay. So we're already talking about 6 to 7x difference in wow. performance of your query. And for interactive workloads, for interactive scenarios, that may be like a huge uh, oh, deal. Yeah. And uh, in the cloud environment, at yeah. least it talks to uh, like the, the nice property of the cloud environment is that yep. you can always translate performance into, into cost. Like if okay. it takes longer for you to run your queries, that means that you need to stand up your cluster for a longer time and yeah. it will take, uh, it will cost you more. Okay. So, so that's the impact of the performance and uh, just a quick look at, the, at this query graph of unoptimized query graph. You can see that, oh, where is my nice blue rectangles? 
So now there is no nice blue rectangle, they're all broken up. And if you look at it closer, you can see that there's a fact table, and then we do some exchanges, sort in, sort merge, join. So that's one of the signs of why your query is performing now not as optimal oh, as, yeah, as okay. it can be. So impact of performance can be, or oh, impact of optimization can be significant. And with new Spark engine, uh, there are certain things that uh, it requires you to do yeah. or understand to get the maximum, the max out of, uh, the maximum performance out of it. Okay, cool. Yeah, and, and um, yeah, like you said, I think we'll, you know, we'll be talking about that in, come in future shows about. Yeah, so the, yeah. the point of the series is we'll go like from basic scenarios or basic techniques to more advanced techniques, kind of in yeah. a step-by-step -step manner. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So uh, just to start, kind of this discussion uh, of why how you optimize performance in Spark. Maybe we can, for, for, for today, we can sort of uh, focus on some kind of a high-level overview yep, okay. of what you actually need to care about in the first place. So what is this blue rectangles that we talked yeah. about? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what, do, what do they do? Yeah. So we can uh, start with that. Sure, yep, let's start there. Yeah. So uh, Spark 2.x, uh, uh, there are a few new things uh, were released in Spark 2.x. One of the primary thing is a uh, conclusion of the project tungsten, so okay. so-called project tungsten. So project tungsten was focused on optimizing performance of the core Spark engine. Started from version 1.4, I believe, and it finally kind of was complete in uh, 2.0. Okay. And what it brings, it basically up, uh, modifies the Catalyst query optimizer in Spark to give it ability to, to generate code. Yep. So instead of just uh, like uh, running some um, regular Java functions. It actually now can generate byte, very optimized bytecode right. to process your data. Okay. Uh, then uh, it switched from Java garbage collection management, uh, kind of as a me memory manager, to uh, direct kind of its own native oh, memory management. Yeah, manager. Okay. So it bypasses Java garbage collection and manages memory directly. Oh, okay. Yeah. And finally, uh, it also has completely re-implemented, oh, let's say optimized uh, reader for Parquet files. So oh, okay. Spark, yeah. kind of a, from the from from a community point of view, it's focused on the Parquet. So, and the Parquet uh, file reader was optimized about three x in performance oh, in, the, wow. in the Spark 2.0 release. Yeah. So, if you look at it at this project tungsten from like end to end point of view, uh, you can see that it's kind of start uh, optimized this whole query processing pipeline, starting from yeah. the beginning down to the like the lowest level where you actually read these yeah. files, uh, this data from the from the underlying file. Okay. So all of the in, in the name of performance. So this cool. whole thing was yeah. all about performance so and kind of takes end-to-end -end approach to it. Yeah, so they really looked at the engine and said, how can we optimize the performance in, in from end to end, like you say, end to end. Yeah. yeah. And cool. uh, the, okay. re the results are great. Like uh, at the high level, you can say that, hey, with Spark 2.x, you can get like on average from three to six performance gain. But this is like averages. They kind of, yeah. uh, they, they always kind of hide some little truth that <laughs> yeah. in Spark 1.x, what it could have been like even impossible to run some of the queries. Oh, okay. And now it's uh, with Spark 2.x, it brings much more stability sure. into the into the mix. Cool. Okay. Okay. So um, so let's go through this kind of uh, pieces of the equation. So Catalyst Query Optimizer brings the code generation into the mix. So okay. when, when you run your query, it kind of generates codes at night. But the primary point here is that now with a new engine, it kind of unifies uh, also APIs that you use to run your queries. Like, yeah. for example, in Spark, you can write your data processing job in SQL, mm -hmm. or you can write it in a Python or Scala language using data frame APIs, or even in more sophisticated Python or Scala using data set APIs. And regardless of how you wrote your job, it will actually all go into the same kind of query optimization yeah. engine. So that, that kind mm. of speaks to the, this, again, this nice property of Spark, yeah. why it's so beloved, is that, hey, it solves the uh, problems at a kind of a platform-centric view. Uh, it, yeah, okay. it solves it at the core level in a nice way, and then it builds on top of it, kind of, and okay. gives you ability to like use different, even languages, Python, oh, uh, R, yeah. R, yep. R, Scala, Java, but all of those, like regardless of whether you use Python now with data frames okay. or R, all of your programs will go through the same execution engine. They yep. will all show the same performance with some exceptions, of course. Right. Uh, so that, uh, again, speaks to the power of Spark where you can learn this thing once. 
Oh, and yeah, then okay. Then apply yeah. your knowledge <laughs> across the right. board. Yeah, and I like that. You know, so uh, everything uses the same, so you don't have to relearn or recode for different yeah. languages. Yep. Yeah, that, okay. that's right. Okay, cool. So Love it. Uh, the second <clears throat> most probably significant uh, thing in Spark is that uh, it ditched this uh, Java garbage collection. Oh, thing. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, if you had experience with Spark 1.x, uh, it was good. It was good. But sometimes, in, in some cases, uh, you would run your job over like this small data and it would run fine. Yeah. You would run it with a larger data set and it would run a little slower than you would expect based on the size okay. of the data set. Mm -hmm. Then you would start running on a large and larger data set and it would start running slower and slower in an exponential way. Wow, until okay. it will actually, your ex executors will start to fail and when you look at the exception say, hey, garbage collection overhead ex exceeded or something of that sort. Mm -hmm. And at this point you're like, wow, wait a second, what, what's going on? <laughs> this whole thing is crumbling <laughs> yeah, yeah. on its fundamental kind of promise. Uh, it cannot process the data. And the irony of that is that uh, Hadoop and it's in its way Spark kind of take a bet on the Java as a platform for big data uh, processing. Yep, yep. And in these cases, when it starts to fail with garbage collection overhead, what's going on is that uh, Spark tries to, uh, like at least in 1.x era, try to process every piece of your data, every row and every field of its data as a separate Java object. Oh, okay. And that means that it produces like billions and billions of billions of this object. And Java garbage collector gets overwhelmed with that number yeah. of objects. It was never designed to handle that thing. Yeah, yeah. So that's the that's irony, like this fundamental platform of Java. <laughs> big data processing <laughs> can't handle big data. <laughs> yeah, was taken for the big data processing <laughs> and it's failing on its face, <laughs> just yeah. not, not being able to handle this core use case. Yeah. Interesting. So that, that was pretty fundamental flaw uh, yeah. in Spark 1.x. And this uh, whole taxing project, kind of one of the primary goals was to get this problem resolved. Yeah. And this is where this direct manage management comes into play. It's not only more efficient from the size perspective, like in Java. Uh, in Java, when you allocate an object, you yeah. have to pay an overhead in just in size to store it. So uh, the, when you uh, go directly and uh, place your objects in a bin binary format, yep. uh, you don't need to pay this overhead. But more importantly, you, you now don't need to do this garbage collection. Like you know, Spark now just allocates this large chunks of memory and uh -huh. manages every object inside of it by itself. So Java is not aware of it. So okay. you can basically like just any C++ program that has yeah. its own memory management, Spark now does exactly the same thing and kind of resolves this fundamental problem. Okay. So that's very important for, and that's cool. for Spark. Yeah. And the final thing, like the another core part of the Spark um, new engine uh, that kind of connected or related to the direct management, management technique is yep. its code generation capabilities. Uh, the highlight of that code generation capability is that it takes kind of a whole stage approach. Okay. So imagine you have this very simple query you, where you scan data, do some filtering, do some projection by selecting columns, yeah. and then you aggregate stuff. Yeah. So now with the whole stage code gen, what Spark will do, it will say that, hey, let me analyze all of these nodes of your query plan. Okay. And uh, let each node in my query en execution engine generate a relevant piece of bytecode that would do exactly the thing that it okay. needs to do at the lowest level possible, and then I'll put all of the separations together yeah. in a single 